1941. I speak to you from 10 Downing Street, here in the capital and the governing center of this battered but indomitable city and island. The enemy still retains the initiative. We have not the power to take it from him. What tragedies, what horrors, what crimes that Hitler and all that Hitler stands for brought upon Europe and the world. Hitler may spread his course far and wide and carry his curse with him. He may turn and trample this way and that through tortured Europe. Which way will he plunge next? June 15, 1941. Churchill writes to President Roosevelt. It looks as if a vast German onslaught on Russia is imminent. Not only are the main German armies deployed from Finland to Romania, but the final arrivals of air and armored forces are being completed. Behind the shield of the Soviet German pact, Hitler chooses his time and place for attack upon his ally. I gave clear and precise warning to Stalin of what was coming. The Soviet government regarded every warning we gave as a mere attempt by beaten men to drag others into ruin. They hated and despised the democracies of the West. It may be doubted whether any mistake in history has equaled that of which Stalin and the communist chiefs were guilty when they supinely awaited the fearful onslaught which impended upon Russia. June 22, 1941. That day, Hitler announces the greatest march in history has begun. Suddenly, without declaration of war, without even an ultimatum, German bombs rain down from the air upon Russian cities. German troops violated the frontiers. Churchill's private secretary, Mr. John Colville, was at Checkers on that day. I was at Checkers with Mr. Churchill the weekend that Russia came into the war. So I asked him whether, being well known as the leading anti-communist, he mightn't find it rather difficult to know what attitude to adopt. He said he would find no difficulty at all. His life was greatly simplified by the fact that his only objective was the destruction of Hitler. Indeed, he said, if Hitler were to invade hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. No one has been a more consistent opponent of communism than I have. I will unsay no word that I have spoken about it. But can you doubt what our policy will be? We have but one aim and one single irrevocable purpose. We are resolved to destroy Hitler and every vestige of the Nazi regime. Any man or state who fights against Nazism will have our aid. Any man or state who marches with Hitler is our foe. 
That is our policy, and that is our declaration. Since the Mongol invasions of Europe, there has never been butchery on such a scale. And this is just the beginning. Like Napoleon's invasion more than a century before, the Germans, too, tear their way into Russia almost at will. the city of Smolensk falls. One hundred and eighty thousand Russian prisoners are taken. September 26, the city of Kiev falls. Six hundred and sixty five thousand Russian prisoners are taken. October first. Leningrad is besieged. October 6, Moscow, the holy city, comes within range of advancing German guns. On October the 19th, Stalin proclaimed a state of siege in the capital and issued an order of the day. Moscow will be defended to the last. December 4, 1941. The government has already moved to Kuibichev, 500 miles to the east. The Russian armies rallied to the defense of their hearths and homes. The tremendous battle raged along nearly 2,000 miles of front. The Russians fought with magnificent devotion. In spite of violent Russian resistance, the Germans still advance. And then suddenly, Russia's ancient ally arrives on the battlefield. Russia's greatest ally. Winter. 
An entry from the diary of a German officer. An icy blast sniped across the snowy countryside. Temperatures dropped to minus 48 degrees. It was beyond comprehension. Within three days, there were 100,000 casualties from frostbite alone. Death came with icy pinions and stood at our elbow. At the time the German invasion of Russia is beginning, Churchill entertains an important visitor in the sunny garden of 10 Downing Street. The two men plan a secret journey. A voyage so dangerous yet so important that the permission of the cabinet has to be obtained. no idea where we were going or who was to meet us, his bodyguard said. I tried to make a guess at the number of miles we had traveled together. Yes, said Churchill, and I hope it will be a few thousand more. If we get back from this one. We went on at high speed. There were several U-boats reported which we made zigzags and wide diversions to avoid. Absolute wireless silence was sought. Thus, there was a lull in my daily routine and a strange sense of leisure which I had not known since the war began. On the morning of August 9, 1941, HMS Prince of Wales enters Placentia Bay in Newfoundland and drops anchor. There, in a spacious, landlocked bay, which reminded me of the west coast of Scotland, warships protected by strong flotillas and far-ranging aircraft awaited our arrival. There, for three days, I spent my time in company, and I think I may say, in comradeship, with Mr. Roosevelt. In that quiet bay in the Atlantic, where misty sunshine played on great ships which carried the white ensign or the stars and stripes, we had the idea the President and I, that it was necessary to give all peoples, and especially the oppressed and conquered peoples, the simple, rough and ready wartime statement of the goal towards which the British Commonwealth and United States meant to make their way. The Atlantic Charter, a reaffirmation of human rights laid down by the English in the Magna Carta in 1215. The Atlantic Charter, a reaffirmation of human rights laid down by America in her constitution in 1787. To which President Roosevelt adds, after the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny, America and Great Britain hope to see established a peace which will afford assurance that all men in all lands may live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. Sunday morning, August 10. A service is being held for the officers and men of the two ships on board the Prince of Wales. forsake thee. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. This 
service was felt by us all to be a deeply moving expression of the unity of faith of our two peoples. Nearly half those who sang were soon to die. Soon afterward, Churchill sails back to England. On his arrival home, he addresses the crew. Now on your first cruise, you met uh, the Bismarck. And uh, on your second, you met the illustrious president of the United States, who is one of the men who take, will take the greatest part in shaping the immediate future of our civilization. I think you will feel that uh, you have taken part in these important events and uh, that may be uh, an interest to you when the full story can be made known and when the full story of this hard, stern war is told. week of December brings startling changes in the war. On December 6, to the complete surprise of Hitler and the German command, the beleaguered Russians launch a major counteroffensive along the whole central front. The German armor, both north and south of Moscow, was forced back. In the north, the Germans had no better fortune. The Russian army, far from being beaten, was fighting better than ever. For the first time, Nazi blood flowed in a fearful torrent. All the anti-Nazi nations, great and small, rejoiced to see the first failure of a German blitzkrieg. The next day, Sunday, Churchill is at Checkers. It is December 7, 1941. <laughs> The United States was now in the war, up to the neck and in to the death. How long the war would last, or in what fashion it would end, no man could tell. Nor did I at this moment care. Once again in our long history, we should emerge. However mauled or mutilated, we would not be wiped out. Our history would not come to an end. We were no longer alone. The British Empire 
the Soviet Union, and now the United States were bound together with every scrap of their life and strength.